Hey y'all, before we get into this week's episode, we have some exciting news. Right after our season three episode one aired and we announced our brand new Patreon, some amazing sweet teas breezed right on over to our Patreon page and signed up. That's right, we have four, count them, four amazing Patreon friends. We're so excited to welcome Teresa, Nancy, Michael, and Tammy to the Noel tier. We are so honored by your contributions. Truly, thank you. In addition to this shout out, these amazing people have also been getting early access to each week's episode and have started weighing in with their suggestions for additional ways we can grow the show. So if you'd like to join them, please visit the support us section of our website. And I have written a song. Yay! <laughs> because I'm a songwriter. I'm not. So just bear with me and know that I do have an air ukulele here. Oh, and nice. Yes, yes, yes. Because you're a Patreon, a Patreon. We want to tell you that you got it going on because you're a Patreon. We call you Nancy and hello, Tammy. Thank you, Teresa. And don't forget Michael. Thank you, Patreon. <laughs> that was excellent, Selena. <laughs> hello, Wisconsin. <laughs> Welcome to Sweet Tea and TV. I always want to say something else. I was I just about to go and say a podcast about it. <laughs> I always, that's what I think I always want to do. And then I'm like, well, that's not really what we do. So I just stop and then say something awkward instead. And here we are. And you know what I think that is? On Consistency. Brand. Yep. <laughs> we didn't even plan that. We didn't even plan that. <sighs> well, so we had a little break from the questions. But we're going to go back to the question. Gosh darn it. I think that we're out of James Lipton ones, which is what we have been doing. Already? Yeah, he didn't have a lot. Either that or I've messed something up. One of the two. Okay. But what we're going to do today is, so he actually got the questions that he asked inside the actor studio. That was actually based on Bernard Pivot. He's a French talk show host. <laughs> okay. Talk and, show host, at least. I thought you were going to say, a French poet from the 16th century. Mm. No, it's TV. Okay. So Perfect. it's got to be kind of easy, right? I don't know. Um, but so he based his questions on questions I guess this guy asked on his TV show. And so we're going to we're gonna pivot. <laughs> I saw what you did To there. the pivot. Um, and see what he has to say. Question for you today then would be, who would you like to see on a new banknote? Oh, I would have to say Barack Obama. Okay, love it. Want to say anything else? I, he was just a momentous president for a lot of reasons completely unrelated to politics. Mm -hmm. um, and he is diverse uh, and represents a diverse uh, part of the nation that's not been represented in a good way on banknotes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Either that or me. Either <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what about you? Outrospection and <laughs> introspection. Um, so I will tell you my two thoughts. My first thought was, what's a banknote? Oh. <laughs> you know, because I'm so young. I just don't understand physical cash. Money? <laughs> but like, it was just a blip. It was like, oh, a banknote, a banknote. Okay. So that's my first thought. My second thought was uh, the notorious RBG. <laughs> so... <laughs> Got the shirt over there. It says it. Um, for those who are not in the know, which I can't imagine, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just because it's like, I don't know. I feel like she's almost more known these days as RBG. Um, but anyways, um, you know, she just did a lot for women. Um, and I just think she uh, is a really important historical figure. Um, very modern, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but the other thing, this was my very third thought, which is, uh, does this matter to be on a bank note? I was just wondering if they would ever issue a new bank note or like they will a hundred percent. The treasury will reissue 
they'll change the dollar bill or something at some point. Yeah. I think. Well, we almost got Tubman's. Oh, yeah. What happened with that? We had a switch in administrations and then it was decided that it wasn't important anymore. Oh. But just to this point of like, you know, cash isn't as prevalent these days. So while it is an honor, I don't know it's the same level of honor anymore because so many people I feel like don't even like physically see cash anymore. I'm going to level with you. If someone wanted to put me on the penny, I would feel massively honored. Well, Lincoln's there right now, so yeah. I would feel, I mean, any, do, any. there's only so many denominations. I think mm-hmm. there's some we haven't seen, but for the most part, there's only so many. Is there any that shocks you that they're on one? I don't even know who's on all the denominations, to be honest. Well, I've got two for you, because I, all right. Eisenhower, on and he dime. on the dime. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't know. I'm not saying he didn't do some great things. It's just out of all the presidents, that one surprises me for some reason. Even though he's a great president. I'm gonna say, he was probably president when it was introduced. Eisenhower's, like, he introduced, like, the, um, like, the highways. And the byways. <laughs> and the myways. <laughs> <laughs> the Frank Sinatras. <laughs> the Rat Pack. I could take this all the way. We haven't done an extra sugar on Eisenhower yet, so I don't, don't know what Eisenhower it. did. <laughs> yeah. Let's not ruin it for the people. Um, no spoilers. So I, I do think he did. I do think there could be argued he did some really important things for the country. But for whatever reason, that one just stands out to me. And then the one that just really chaps my arse Uh-oh. is Andrew Jackson. Oh. Uh, because, you know, he's just a terrible person that did terrible things. Um, in case you wanted to just a little insight into how Selena feels about the presidents say, that we've had to this point. I don't feel like I have a strong opinion on Jackson, so. Well, it's a little thing called the Cherokee Indians and smallpox blankets. Look it up, people. Um, an, argue, or an argument could be made about many of the early presidents who are all on coinage. That's true. We got problems, people. But we also have solutions. And today's solution... <laughs> Help, Nikki. <laughs> Help with the transition. <laughs> oh, we're going to the episode now. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you had another question. No. Oh. I'm just, just Speaking one of highways and byways, this episode is called Hard Hats and Lovers. Well, look at that. The people who constructed the highways would have been wearing hard hats. I hopefully. see what you're saying. Anyhow, uh, when Charlene talks her boyfriend into dating around, the ladies of Sugar Bakers come up with a solution to end the verbal harassment they've been receiving from a bunch of construction workers. Air date? December 19th, 1988. My asterisk to this air date is, ah, the holidays. What a special time for a sexual harassment episode. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I love it. Let me tell you what I'm going to hate. Uh-oh. Listening back to that laugh right there. <laughs> so just so you know, that was a genuine laugh. And I'm really sorry for everyone listening because my laugh is like the like the devil's anus. I, ooh, I don't like that. Uh, it was music no to my does. ears. Aww. Sounds like little tinkles. Oh, that's nice. What are we calling this episode, Selena? Um, a virtual smorgasbord of women. I wanted to give you credit for that one. You just keep pulling all the good titles. A charcuterie, uh, if you will. <laughs> Written by LBT, directed by David Trainer. Let's go. General reactions slash stray observations to begin with. General reactions. What you got? I felt very confident about the strength of season three until this episode. Mm, mm-hmm, 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 I, mm-hmm. I'm just going to level with you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I thought it was pretty weak. Ah, oh, weak. I did. Oh. Especially coming off of Mary Jo's almost boob job episode. Mm-hmm. It just felt really filler to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. I have zero empathy for Charlene on this one. Okay. As you were saying that, thinking context matters, and I always forget that. Mm-hmm. Coming off a boob job, almost like a like almost like a feminist episode, you know? Like, there's nothing wrong with getting a boob job. It's just not for me. Like, that felt so strong. And then Charlene comes into this one. It's almost like a pseudo-feminist approach. Like, mm-hmm. I can be cool. I can be with it. You go date other women. Mm-hmm. She just really walked herself into this whole episode. Just with nonsense. Well, she may have taken some bad advice. <laughs> Well, sure, but that was a choice she made. I know it's true. It's true. Could you could you imagine? Could you imagine putting all your insecurities aside and telling your significant other, like suspend belief that you and Casey are married right now? 
He's your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Could you put that to the side and say, like, go date someone else? I'm going to tell you that this sounds like something stupid I would have done. But, like, in my early 20s. So this is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Charlene is in her late 20s, yeah. early 30s. Yeah. Bill it's is a little a, late for this decision, I feel like. Bill is a full-grown man. Mm -hmm. He's a full-grown man who could have just told her no. Mm -hmm. It's just a really weird... I appreciated the plot device to help us get to see how Bill feels about Charlene, blah, blah, blah. But it just felt like a really weird way to get there. I had some problems with Bill in this episode, but we'll get there. <sighs> okay, my other general reaction. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at y'all tight-lipped over there. Mm -hmm. Can we discuss Julia and Mary Jo's master plan to stop the harassment by the hard hats? <laughs> oh my God, what? Also a stupid plan, no? Did, there was just We're a, just going to talk to them. No one had any sense in this episode. They just need a good talking to. Yeah, this whole, but you know, this whole coffee, donut, and Anthony, Anthony. plan. <laughs> did this work for you? Poor Anthony's our sacrificial lamb over and over and over again. Yeah. No, the idea that that's the way they're going to put sexual harassment to rest, no. So it just, okay, so for me, it didn't make any sense. It didn't feel true to the characters even, mm. especially Julia. I think she would have taken them on herself. Yes. Um, and I thought it was weird that they trotted out Anthony to make their points. Like that feels, to your point about we just came off what could be argued as a feminist episode, that this feels uh, disempowering. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. And it was also super awkward and unfair to him. So like there's no winners. Yeah. You know? Um, if not killing the plot altogether... I wonder if it could have been peppered in a little differently. So, in between the um, Charlene plot line, show the women getting harassed at different points throughout the episode. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then, have them all get riled up talking about it. Like, when they're coming into the office one by one. Realize maybe that it's all happening to all of them. Then band together, go outside, and the women catcall them. Mm-hmm. And then we could get a reaction shot of the men thrown off or scared by quote unquote female aggression. And then like cut away. But you'd have to show the outside of sugar bakers, which That's I feel like true. we're, we're never going to do that. We had to that. draw them inside. Yeah. Um, we had to lure them in. But this, we're, we're suspending all reality. Yeah. They're all budget problems. Yeah. <laughs> all of that and saying like, I think it like, especially for that time period. Like, to see women in the 80s catcalling construction workers, turning that device on its head then, I think that would have been funny. I think we do eventually see that in some sitcoms, but not this early. It's almost like she towed up to the line of talking about this very difficult issue and this, like, pervasive, I guess, issue. I've actually never been catcalled, which is another thing that you could put under my never been a bridesmaid thing. Like, it says more about me than everybody else, but... I've never actually been catcalled. I don't see it happen very often. It's a lot more leery sort of stuff these days. Um, but I guess it happened a lot in the 80s. It seems like a real problem. Um, my favorite sitcom of modern times is um, King of Queens, which you know. Mm -hmm. There was an episode where Carrie was feeling really bad about herself. She was turning 30, maybe even. Here we go. Up. She's feeling bad about herself. So his way of fixing it for her was <laughs> to go get the construction workers to cat call her <laughs> because mm -hmm. they were being so respectful mm -hmm. and not cat calling her. So things change. Times change. Yeah. Things do change. And I was having a lot of feelings about this one because, okay, I just want to say that probably the reason that you haven't been cat called, I'm just going to continue to be, uh, let me be your Julia Sugar Baker. Let me be your voice of reason. Okay. See, um, I have experienced cat calling and it's not because I'm special because I'm not. You but I used special. to watch. I used to walk home every night and every day from work in downtown Atlanta. There's a lot of opportunity when mm. you're on foot mm. a lot. Yeah, that's overwhelming. You that know? scares me. So, like, there's a lot of. Let me tell you, people shout weird things. <laughs> weird things, Nikki. <laughs> you're not missing out on much. No, but I, I don't. was thinking to your point of like, okay, because you're like, I haven't been catcalled, but I'm thinking this was a problem in the '80s. Well, I'm here to tell you, Nikki, this was a problem much past the '80s. Mm. I don't know about construction workers. I mean, I know that trope, but just in general, I think men feeling they can say whatever to whomever is always a problem. Yeah, and I mean, for me, I was thinking like, I, this 
this really hasn't happened in a long time. And then I was like, oh, I just turned 37. <laughs> and then I was like, oh. And then my voice kept getting higher in my head. And I was like, I'm going to take a nap. So I don't know. I have no ender there. So the storyline, okay, wasn't great. But I did like how, the, like, the construction of the episode. So we had these two dual plot lines. Mm -hmm. But they involved the entire cast in one way or another. And then almost, in my opinion, seamlessly brought them back together at the end. So you got a chance to see all the characters. One of my complaints is always we don't see enough Anthony. Uh -huh. We got Anthony folded into this episode. Everybody comes together in the end. Thank you for bringing in that positive point. Because we do often sit here and say, more Anthony, more Anthony. Then we get more Anthony, and I'm like, your plot device doesn't make sense. Right. So, good, yes. He was there. It, yes, good job. I think, um, I, I'm I'm out of general reactions, but I do have some stray observations. I do too. Okay, yeah. fire away. Well, imagine what sort of reaction Mary Jo would have gotten from the construction workers if she'd had the surgery in the last episode. I think that she would have gotten reaction no matter what. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> because she has a pulse. But imagine the reaction if she had been goo goosh. Right. She would have gotten a Suzanne reaction yes, is what you're saying. Right. Well, gotcha. Suzanne reaction in her head. Um, where are we on the old cooking steaks in the fireplace situation during Bill and Charlene's date? Is that what they were doing? That's what she said. I've always loved a steak in the fireplace. Shut up. How yes. did I miss that? That's weird, right? Grease and fire inside the house? Doesn't sound like a good idea. Yeah. Oh my gosh. How did I miss that? You weren't like watching the script care. for cut lines. <laughs> oh, right, 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 Han. Um, those, those are my two strays. Okay. They I felt like the most pressing strays. issues. I think cover. that's a very pressing issue. Um, I'm like, I have to go take a walk. <laughs> so we get a reference to a new ex-husband of Suzanne. Did you catch yes, that? Yes. Jay Benton Stone Cipher. Yeah, that was a whole name. I also want to say that LBT must really love that last name. Stone, Stone Cipher. Cipher. Oh, we have heard, heard that. that a number of times. I think this might be the third time. Good Lord. Uh, I do not believe the Country Club Gala was up to Suzanne's expectations. It looked not great. <laughs> it's like the prom from <laughs> season two or the dance. That... It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> it did. <laughs> It was uh, bad. Will yeah. someone please give LBT a little bit more money? She for needs these a sets? budget. Yeah. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what we liked. I just alluded to this one. Suzanne's paraphrasing of how the men yelled at her. In Suzanne's world, it's all applause and hey, gorgeous, hey, beautiful, <laughs> hey, best looking woman left on earth. But in reality, it's yo ho hot stuff. <laughs> I just like that. I like the world she lives in. I want to live there with her. It's much better than in my world. <laughs> Where things are like not great, but then I make them decidedly worse. Crawl back under the bridge, you troll. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But really he's saying, yo ho, hot stuff. <laughs> uh, Anthony's manic giggles just continue to get me. Yeah. When the construction workers are... Um, I think when they arrived, but he also did it a little bit when they were like, you're not going to do that like nervous laugh, are you? And then the construction workers arrive and he's like, ah! <laughs> I love it. he's the best. It's just another one of those examples. Like we were just talking about with Mary Jo in the last episode where we get this little like quirk of the character and then we just continue to revisit it. So you feel like you're getting to know this person. Right. So like, I know how Anthony tends to react to these situations. He feels like a friend in a way, which is sad. Yeah. I'm like, wah, wah. <laughs> so, well, I, I liked his imitation of catcalling. Oh, I thought right. that was pretty good. <laughs> that's my last one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's hilarious. I wish I could, like, I can't exactly, I wrote down what he says. Um, do you remember how he says it? No. Okay, I think he goes, woo, ooh, baby, baby, <laughs> and then goes into that manic laughter and that growl thing I just did guys was a growl I'm not very my growl maybe but like not so cat I heard it it okay. sounded good okay so that was number one for me and my second like uh was while the construction worker stuff on the whole didn't really work for me I did think it was a pretty good plot twist and idea that they brought in the wives mothers and girlfriends to get onto them for their behavior. I'm going out on a limb to guess that this has been LBT's solution to this problem, like, all along. Like, I can see her 
I'm starting to like envision her in like certain situations. Like I can see this coming up in a topic of conversation with people and her being like, well, you know what they need to do? <laughs> Just bring in the wives and the mothers, the sisters, women they can identify with. And then she put it in the episode. Yeah. So that was my other like things we didn't like. Uh huh. That whole Charlene challenge to Bill. Yeah. Why am I dumb? It's just dumb. It it wasn't it wasn't the most fully fleshed idea out idea, and I think like I think it all a lot of things a lot of bad ideas start with good intentions, right? They say that <laughs> something like that happens. <laughs> I mean, what? So was there anything else like just besides you thinking it was dumb that I just, just thought didn't it work for you? I just thought it was dumb. I just thought it was dumb. I I would like to hear your thoughts on Bill because. I'm holding him harmless for the most part because I feel like he was put in a crappy situation except to say he's an adult and he could have just said no. But I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Bill. I feel like Bill... Where do we start? I feel like he took a turn in this episode. Really? I've generally liked him and I still like him. I just... And by the way, again, this always feels a hair silly because we're talking about people who aren't real and honestly... I guess I don't like LBT's perception of this character, Mm. what she's kind of building into his character. Um, Because this passive aggression, aggressive thing he does to Charlene's dating life prior to their relationship was just a no go for me. So I wrote down some of this interaction. Um, Okay. This is him talking. You know, I don't much care for the way you throw around that word dated, but as long as we're on that subject, just exactly how many people have we dated? Uh, This is Charlene. Well enough to know that I wouldn't be wondering later on what I've missed out on. Quite frankly, I wouldn't mind you wondering a little bit. What's that supposed to mean? It means I'm not especially thrilled with the notion that you can find contentment with me now that you've systematically eliminated the entire Seventh Fleet. So, on the one hand, I see how that it's a well-written dialogue between two people, and I do get that, so I don't want to take that away. It's even... It, I even see the humor in that. I'm not, like, a dish towel. But what strikes me in this, though, is that... It's just this whole thing again where we're doing that vintage misogyny mm. and it just bums me out. Oh. Like she's saying she's dated and no, he's bringing into this thing that's kind of like, it's like low key slut shaming. Mm-hmm. Um, also, we kind of know that Charlene from other things that she said, she hasn't really, it doesn't sound to me, it, first of all, it doesn't matter. I don't care if she did do the Seventh Fleet. That matters to me not. But she's already kind of built out this thing that she doesn't really sleep with a lot of people. It's just not what she does. Mm -hmm. And so for him to take and twist this and make it sound like that, I thought was really unfair. When you point things out like this, sometimes I realize maybe how desensitized I am to some of this. Because that was like, I have heard so much worse slut shaming on tv shows oh yeah (laughs) like i was honestly i laughed a little bit throughout that section i thought the dialogue was written really well um and honestly like it didn't even hit me as like over overly slut i've just heard so much worse on much more modern tv shows well and i think that i think that absolutely explain like how much we hear it yeah that's not a hit on you that's not a hit on how much you've had to hear. Yeah. Because you know what? It is really rude to insinuate that someone has screwed their way through an entire fleet. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Yeah. You know, especially if you mean it like not in an applauding way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. it's not like he's like, good job. Yeah. You know, it's rude. So I do think this discussion of how many partners like don't when you have it, 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 it feels just, safer not to just it really don't does. Do it. <laughs> it really does feel safer not to. But I think it's something a lot of couples talk about. We all know the rules of three. <laughs> Women are going to divide and men are going to multiply. So move on. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Lesson learned. And you know what? We shouldn't have to. Yeah. But like, yeah, I just agree. In general, for me, it's just probably that thing that like, does it really matter? Do we want to even bring that old baggage into this new thing that we're trying to build together? Anyways, so. What else didn't you like? Because I'm getting the sense there's a lot. Actually, I that this is, I got just a couple more things. 
So you said you liked the way they brought everything together at the end. And you smirked and Have kind of rolled your eyes. some nitpicks. <laughs> so I do agree that... Agree to disagree. I agree. I agree it's nice they brought everyone back together. I, I like the fact that they're giving everyone something to do. But so Charlene and Suzanne come into Sugar Bakers in their costume <laughs> while the construction workers and their mom's wives and girlfriends were there. So... We're just going to suspend a lot of reality for that to come together. It's still daylight outside. What gala would bring them back during daylight? A bruncheon? Then it wouldn't be a gala, right? I don't know. Is there a requirement that a gala has to happen at night? In my head, they're only at night. Ah. I feel like, but this is definitely a costume party in the middle of the day. <sighs> Unless it's Halloween. Uh, even still. But it wasn't. It These was are December. adults. Yeah. So the. So, I hear you. Yeah. And so I just the, stupid. Even if it was early, let's say that like it, they just left early because it sucked and it was horrible and whatever. And that and makes it's sense. summertime in the show. But Bill then doesn't have time to dance twice with multiple women, which is a complaint of Charlene's there that she's had to watch him dance with woman after. You need time to dance with woman after woman after woman multiple times. So, I didn't like that. And then... So, there's that. There's that right there. And then the last thing for me is, the way they wrote and played the construction workers was, like, pretty over the top. Um, oh, fat chick's t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Mama, you fine as wine. You got to be mine, because I love your visible panty line. <laughs> huh? <laughs> In that King of Queens episode, incidentally, they're like, so you want us to cat call your wife? And he's like, yeah, I want you to. And he goes, so you want us to say things like, and I can't remember what he says, is that a mirror in your pocket? Or are you just, what? <laughs> I can see myself in them or whatever. Right, right, uh -huh. And he pulls out some lines like that. So I really do think when you become a construction worker and they give you your hat, they give you a joke book. Oh, uh, ways to cat just call. real winners. Because he really just pulls them right out. Wouldn't it be funny if they'd use the same poem? Yeah, that would be funny. <laughs> so, but they said visible panty line. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, nobody likes a panty line. Maybe I am a pearl clutcher. <laughs> These things are happening. I'm like, how did they say that just then? What? Uh, okay. I mean, the other thing is other over the top actions. They're like overly burping when they come into sugar bakers. <laughs> they're like weirdly aggressive. You mentioned the no fat chicks t-shirt. <laughs> they're literally, they're literally hooting and hollering. So I'm just going to say this also feels really unfair to construction workers. Yeah. It's flipping rude. Construction so, shaming. Yeah. And haven't we all had enough of that? I'm done. So I'm not saying that stereo this stereotype doesn't exist. I'm just asking, what are we doing here? Which is basically, I think, my sum up for the episode. <laughs> LBT had a bad run in with a construction worker one time. I guess so. And on that note, are you ready to rate the sucker? I am. What you got? My rating scale is... <laughs> That's my invitation of Anthony's manic laugh. That's pretty good. I give it a three out of five, and I want you to know, I scored it down while we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> this was a garbage episode. I was just in a good mood from the last two. You know what? Construction workers. We're never getting LBT on here. <laughs> just, we love you. We, Absolutely. Just don't listen to this episode. I listen mean, to the extra sugar from season two. I honestly, I feel I feel bad for anyone who had to write 22 episodes. And truly, it's like... too much. We've said before, and I do not shy away from saying this, LBT could tell us to go just, like... Fly a kite. But can you come on the show and tell us? Well, sure, yeah. Open yeah. up an Instagram handle. Because I think we would... Uh, we've said multiple times, we don't know what we're talking about here. We're just talking. We're, we're just riffing. We're just... <laughs> what are we here for? We're not experts. <laughs> we know we nothing. Know no we know nothing. <laughs> Listen to our show. Pay us. <laughs> Give us some cash. I gave it two out of five. Yikes. Visible panty line. <laughs> I feel like that should just go ahead and be a zero. Because I'm with you. Nobody likes a visible panty line. Nobody likes that. That's mm -hmm. not sexy. Anyways, I've spoken at length about why this one didn't work. So I won't rehash all of that again. That's it. Two out of five. <laughs> But let's talk about who buttered our biscuits. Who won this episode, Nikki Mays? 
this was a tough I'm not sure there are truly any winners in this one, but I will say, um, Bill and Charlene, like I wasn't cheering for this storyline at all, but mm-hmm. I'm glad their fairy tale seems to be moving forward. Yeah. I think Bill won the episode. Because, like, yeah, Charlene asked for a weird thing, but he got some dances out of it. Mm. And Charlene's, Charlene seems to love him even more now, so not too shabby. That's good. How about lumps in your gravy? Construction workers' wives and loved females. Imagine finding out how terrible the man you love has been to other women. Yeah. Wow, that sucks. Yeah, that would be bad. That would be bad. Well, mine was Charlene's date to the gala gala. (laughs) Randy. First his date blows him off all night. Then she leaves with another man. Suzanne was mean to him. It's just not Randy's night. (laughs) It was so funny when he said, but when we dance, that puts my head right at your chest level. And you said, you don't like that. She said, just turn your head. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Randy. How about some 80s things? I don't know if this is fair to put here, but I did, so. Okay. Fire me. <laughs> uh, another reference to Cosmo. I think this oh, is... Oh, another one? We just had one in the last episode. It feels 80s. hmm mm-hmm. I mean, except for Cosmo. Come on the show. Well, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, Cosmo's definitely oh, like still a thing. Like flipping through a right. magazine. Got yeah. it, got it. Uh, picking up the phone and calling Mike Tyson for tips on relationships. Uh, I had to look this one up. I obviously know who Mike Tyson is. Yeah. But, like, again, context being important, I didn't really understand. I I thought it was a boxer joke. When I looked it up, actually, at the time of writing this episode, Mike and his first wife, actress Robin Givens, were having substantial marital issues, including allegations of domestic assault, which adds a little pepper to this joke. It felt like a weird joke, kind of, when you know that. I think in today's world, that joke would not have flown. Yes. I, yeah, We're I just, not making any Johnny Depp, uh, Amber Heard jokes on national TV right now. No. Now, are other people? Yes. TikTokers, yes. But not like, uh, not, Modern not a showrunner. That yeah. show's not on anymore. But mm. still. There, this is us. That's not relevant for that show. <laughs> I don't know any comedy. Young Sheldon? <laughs> Definitely not a Young Sheldon joke because it's in the 90s. Right. Or 80s Dog or on something. It. It's got to be this. Well, 80s maybe because Sheldon. Yeah, because Sheldon. Any hoozy. That's, that's going to be the third 80s. show that he makes. Cause Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mine was cat calling construction workers. Mm. It feels very much a trope of this time. I was talking a little bit about that earlier. Also something from the 90s. You know, I think it was used so much around that era that um, it really got worn out. Mm-hmm. In fact, I haven't seen that on a lo- that like whole trope on a show in a while. Yeah. Um, until actually HBO Max put out a show recently called Minx. Um, and it did have a fun twist on these scenes. But it's a period piece taking place in the 70s. Oh. So it, they're definitely setting up s- some feminist uh, ideas there. And uh, I'm just going to say also, I'm just going to plug the show. It's really, really good. Super inappropriate. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that, like, maybe don't have your kiddos in the room. <laughs> like, in the way of euphoria, there's a lot of random penises in there. So I'm, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Happy Saturday to me. I'm just saying, we really do that a lot now. We're like, how it's many penises can we get in just like 30 seconds flat? And the answer, guys, is astounding. <laughs> when you go 100 years into te- television with none of them, you, you got to get all of them the in. Some point. It does feel like between Euphoria and this show, I was like, I have seen 50 bajillion penises. Clip that, Nikki. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Because there's no slut shaming around here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Southern things. Um, the Royal Theater? Yeah. That's what Suzanne and Charlene were working on something for in the beginning of the episode to support a renovation. Mm-hmm. Um, I found there was a Royal Theater or Bailey's Royal Theater in the Sweet Auburn neighborhood of Atlanta. Opened in 1933 and operating during segregation. It served the black community, but it closed in 1969. And I didn't see any reference to a word of, uh, like, renovation in the 80s, which was the whole thing they were doing. They were renovating mm-hmm. this theater. But that, like, if that is that theater, that's a really nice Atlanta. Deep cut. Yes. And, like, and really nice, too, because, like, 
Sweet Auburn, that whole area, which is really small, actually. But, like, that has a lot of history mm-hmm. in that neighborhood. So what a really cool reference. Yeah. If for And we've talked about this before. Actually, you've specifically said it. Like, how did LBT do this Do this in a pre-Google days? Right. It's pretty amazing. I mean, she's Crazy. not from Atlanta. No. So it's impressive. My only other thing was Charlene says to Bill at one point, um, they're getting riled. Oh. Mm-hmm. And that feels very Southern. References we need to talk about. There were a lot of costumes that are probably just at least worth mentioning. Uh-huh. As, as these words are coming out of my mouth, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, Liz Taylor as Cleopatra, um, Mickey Rooney. I was confused at Charlene's reaction when Suzanne said he was going as Mickey Rooney. Mm-hmm. She was like, what is he wearing? And she says, Mickey Rooney. And Charlene kind of pulls a face. Um, I Googled mm. a little bit. And I guess, and I mean this with all respect due to... Um, the late great Hollywood legend. I guess he wasn't all that attractive. He's a character actor. He was. And that should tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, he was not a heartthrob. I think she was hoping for maybe more of a Charlton Heston. <laughs> I'm like, where are you going with this? What are you going to? Well, William Holden, maybe. Yeah, uh, Charlton Heston. He was a good-looking guy. Yeah. Catherine Hepburn in Lion of Winter. Lion in Winter. Mm-hmm. I had to look this up too. Mm-hmm. Um, 1968 British movie about uh, Henry the Second of England in the 1100s. <laughs> really taking it back. You know My God. Uh, for the movie, Hepburn won her third Best Actress Oscar. Yeah, I can't, like I'm I I do know that movie, but I've never seen it, and it's probably time to close up that movie gap. Mm. That's all. I wasn't you thinking won't be watching. <laughs> I'm like, I'll not never you. see it. That's all. I'll I had. never know. <laughs> um, okay, so I just wanted to add. I also looked into Mike Tyson. Um, you covered the Robin Givens thing. One other interesting thing about that is around that time, so. Robin Givens actually, like, accuses him of domestic abuse on live TV in a pretty infamous Barbara Walters interview. Accuses feels like a really terrible word to... to, But she, like, brings it out into the light in a live interview, which is a pretty bold move, I think, um, for any time period. But I think especially in the 80s, because I just feel like, again, this is something that just sort of got relegated to the shadows, you know? I read he was sitting in the audience when she did it. I, I know he's there. I thought they were, like, being interviewed together at the same time. Oh, you're right. You're right. He was. He was on set when it happened. I, I can't. I, just, I think if I was Barbara Walters, I would have just melted into the floor. I felt like there was a little bit more missing to it, and I probably could have dug a little deeper, but I was so, I should have just watched it because I was like, what was his reaction? Yeah. Yeah. But my Googling does have its limits. The same. But, you know, so, but I was thinking, like, it was possible the interview happened right around when they were filming the episode, and LBT, like, wound up coming back and adding it to the script. Right. I was actually thinking, it made me think about your extra sugar, Nikki, where um, you told us that she was notorious for changing scripts right up until the last minute. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like maybe this wasn't sitting well with her. And it shouldn't have. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. Um, I also, I, this is just something that came up, and I was just astounded by his career as a professional boxer Mm. only because I'd never looked at his record before. Um, because I was, I'm more familiar with the things that have happened outside of the ring when it comes to Mike Tyson. Well, the biting of the ear in the ring, which I saw live. Yeah. Um, when that happened. Um, but so he's had 58 fights, only six losses and 44 were wins by a knockout. That's nuts. Like, That's why they named the game Mike Tyson's Knockout. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. So, anyways, I just also my uh, complete lack of knowledge about anything sports related. <laughs> I do not enjoy boxing. But growing up, my parents really did. I just don't understand. I don't want to see two people just it's not for me. beat the heck out of each other. But, like, it's the typical gladiator stuff. It's just not for me. I just can't believe we haven't moved entirely away from that. Yeah. Like this idea of, again, that's fine. Do what you want to do. I'm not trying to, do, I'm just saying it's weird to me that we're in 2022 and that's still acceptable to, it just keeps getting worse, to like watch people knock the crap out of each other. Do you know what's weird to me is that we talk about um, concussions in football. And it Maybe it's happens. a foregone conclusion that boxers have a lot of issues, mm-hmm. but like we're not talking about that. Do we not want to talk about their mental health and... Maybe well, I don't Tyson? think we do enough doing it with for NFL players. 
Oh, really? Not really. I mean, we're not doing anything about it, but everybody no, knows it's a I problem think, now. I, I don't know. I guess, like, I feel like anytime you talk about anything, welcome to Nikki and Selena's sports <laughs> podcast. I Where think, we're going to say things like, I mean, it's boxing, right? Or is it MMA? What's MMA? It's Krav Maga? Oh. MMA is where I just put my face That's in my much. hands and cry a little. Is that when they go into the, what is it called? Going into the cage? <laughs> I don't know. I just know they kick the crap out of each other. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I was just going to say, I think anytime you follow that trail back, if there's lots of money to be made, suddenly everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And that is usually in general, my problem with sports. So we probably won't be getting a lot of sports, <laughs> whatever on here, because I'm not into it anyways. So uh, Liz Taylor, I, I'm wondering, do be, I know people our age, maybe people are, do people our age know who Liz Taylor is? I don't even know. Surely our age, not the generation behind us, maybe. I, I don't know, but it feels like, important to say, if you do not know, she was a child actor in the early 1940s. She goes on to be one of the most popular stars of classic, classical Hollywood cinema in the 1950s. And I did want to say that I think much like Tyson, she was also very famous for things that happened outside of her craft. So at the time, she was very scandalized for the number of marriages she had, eight, but also having, I don't care. I'm just saying it was eight. And at that time, it was a lot of gossip around it. She also had an affair with Eddie Fisher, who was married to Debbie Reynolds and who was basically America's sweetheart at the time. Um, I also think this is interesting that if you think about it, that Suzanne was dressed up like Liz Taylor because Liz Taylor had a lot of marriages. Suzanne had a lot of marriages. I think Suzanne married her, one of her husbands at least more than once. And so did Liz Taylor. I don't think this is the first time they've drawn a parallel between to Suzanne and Liz Taylor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which is true. They really do look a lot alike. They're two very beautiful women. Uh, and I think you covered all the rest of mine. So thank you. <laughs> Welcome. And it's what we call a time saver. Well, Nikki's, what I'm saying is Nikki is brief in her explanation and I am long. So this is a thank you from the audience to Nikki. <laughs> I just consider it a, a taste tester when I just sort of throw out a, but here's a fact you could know about Henry II and then 1100s or whatever. Well, you me go too. Google it yourself. And then I like to take you through the full breakdown. We like to do a little dissertation. <laughs> What about cut lines for this one? There were two cut lines in the scene where the ladies are talking about the construction workers at the beginning of the episode. First, I'm pretty sure we missed another instance of Dixie Carter deadpanning an impression. She did this, I think, in season two. Right after um, someone says the guy was wearing a no fat chick shirt, this conversation happened. Probably Mary Jo said, oh, oh him. He's had that on since last summer. I hate him. Makes you wonder about his wife, doesn't it? I mean, does she kiss him goodbye in the morning and say, gee, honey, you sure look handsome in your no fat chicks t-shirt. Hope I didn't put too much starch in it. Have a nice day. Charlene said, Julia, what did he say to you? Charlene, why do you always want to know these things? Oh, just curious. Come on, we all told. All right, Charlene, if you must know. He said, uh, looking good. I want it. I need it. Got to, got to have it now. <laughs> so I feel like we missed that. Uh, yeah. Then just after Suzanne said it's the way Julia walks, but before Mary Jo says a woman has a right to walk down the street without being jeered, Julia said, Suzanne, it has nothing to do with the way I walk. It has to do with the culture that encourages some men to embarrass women as public sexual objects in the dim hope that somehow it will allow the men in question to cling to their ill-imagined superiority. Whew. So you see, we lost some good Julia in this episode, yeah. which I think is relevant to something you said way early on, which is Julia would have taken these men on. Yeah. And we lost that. What yeah. little bit of Julia we had. I don't like it. So that was it in cut lines. Okay. So next episode, episode seven, curtains? Coitons. Coitons. Oh, that's good. Feels like it has to be. Huh. Also, we'll come to find out that they're, I'm just going to go ahead and foreshadow. Uh -oh. They don't seem to be clear on the name. <laughs> because oh. <laughs> somebody else it says the time i can't remember it's imdb or whatever but it's like but they're nice curtains it's oh, like the right, name right, of the episode right, right. or something i'm like what what which one is it anyway so we're gonna call it coitons coitons so as always we'd love everyone to follow along with us and engage instagram and facebook at sweet tea and tv our email address is sweet tea tv pod at gmail.com and our website is www.sweetteatv.com 
and hang tight for this week's extra sugar. We're going to talk about the history of dating. Mm. It's more exciting than it sounds, I promise. I have no doubt. Well, you know what that means. What does it mean, Selena? We'll see you around the bend. Bye. Welcome to this week's edition of Extra Sugar, where we're going to explore the hot and heavy history of dating. Ooh. What do you want to call this segment, Selena? We're going to call it the Tinder Bender. <sighs> She's got gold over here in this brain of hers. So in this episode, do you think it's fair to say we learned that Charlene and Bill have maybe different ideas about how and when a person has to date? I think we absolutely learned that. So Charlene's over here thinking you got to play the field a bit to know what you like and know what you don't like. Also from Suzanne, though. Right. We don't really know what she thought. Suzanne got in her head, but yes. Okay. Well, that's... Play the field. Yep. So Bill over here thinks when you know, you know. Mm -hmm. Where do you fall in there? Oh. (laughs) I didn't know there would be questions for me. I'll tell you. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay. I don't think you have to date around, like, your entire life. I think you just be you. You just be whatever feels natural to you. Right. That's not, it's not, not the subtext of our entire podcast. I totally, yes. And I think it totally differs depending on who you are. I think some people do need to get out there and see what's out there. Mm-hmm. I think there are definitely, there. the high school sweetheart thing exists for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. There are those people who they just meet the one person and they never need to be with another person. And that's okay too. Everybody has a different journey. That's my answer. That's a good answer. Your answers are so much better than my James Lipton answers. When you put me on the spot, you do much better. So before we start, I want to make my inclusivity programming note. This segment will be U.S.-centric because that's where we live, and that's what I identified with the most when putting together the segment. Okay. Dating cultures are, like, super different all around the world. One is not better than the other. They're simply different. So I don't want anybody to feel weird or othered if the things we talk about here um, and things that happen here in the U.S. don't happen like wherever they're from or whatever culture they identify with. That's thing one. This is also going to be a really heteronormative segment because to be honest, that's the way relationships have been reported on in our country. Um, And I believe Mm -hmm. in many countries for a long time. So that's the way a lot of the source material is written. Um, So if you're not heterosexual, we see you. We always just want you to know that. So on to the big show. (laughs) Da, da, da. <laughs> Queuing you up. <laughs> Thank you. I think many of us know that dating has not always been a thing. Um, I found a New York Post article about a book called Labor of Love, which explores the history of dating. Um, and it said that even the word date was only coined in 1896. Oh. And it was coined by a Chicago record columnist. And it sounds like maybe it was even an inadvertent invention of the term. So he was writing a column about working class lives and told the story of a guy whose girlfriend started seeing other men after she lost interest in him. So the man says, I suppose the other boys fill in all my dates. That's where the word date came from. Hmm. Until the turn of the 20th century, courting was the way to go. That's what I was thinking was about courting. Mm -hmm. It's definitely much more formal and structured than a quick like swipe right Tinder date. Um, at that point, women, along with their parents, would meet with male suitors privately. And they were not super concerned with grand romantic gestures. It's very Bridgerton. Yes. In case people need like a visual. Yes. Um, they really wanted to interview these guys about things like financial and social status. Can you imagine? Wild, right? So awkward. Yes. Um, They definitely wouldn't, like, nip out for a private little dinner or anything. Their activities would take place at home or in, like, really big public settings. So Mm -hmm. to your point, Bridgerton. Um, As the century turned, this concept of coordinating marriage matches shifted, like, a little bit. While marriage was still the ultimate goal, the process was a little more freewheeling. Mm -hmm. Maybe, dare I say, allowed for a little more personal choice. Um, So that's where we see the gentleman caller. Um, If a suitor was interested in a girl, he'd come to her house and hopefully be welcomed into the parlor. After that, if all went well, he could be invited back during set times whenever he wanted. So it's like, come back anytime between six and seven. It's wild. (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) I'll add here that my sorority house in Athens, which was built in the late 1800s, I had to look this up. um, They even had a special room for this. 
Um, the courting room? It was a parlor that existed just for courting. Mm. Um, so obviously I went to college much more recently than the 1890s because I'm so young, <laughs> um, though not much. Uh, we used it for that reason too. So men weren't allowed into the living quarters of the house, which were the upstairs place. Mm -hmm. um, they had to kind of stay in that room or the main floor of the house. Okay. But sororities, they're getting better and better for you, aren't they? <laughs> sure. I am so um, curious, and I don't expect you to have the answer, but like if parents were the people who were kind of like monitoring and asking these questions when this was done in the home parlors, like who in the world in sororities was like, We had oh. a house mom. Okay. But, but in the 1890s. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. This ha My sorority house, sorry, I should clarify. My sorority house was built for, uh, it was called the wedding house. It was a wedding gift for um, a, a man, a businessman. I don't remember his story, but for his daughter. God, I'm so glad that's the reason behind that name. Yes. I thought it was going to be like, I went to school to get my MRS. No, okay. uh, it didn't become a sorority oh, house you. until later, 60s okay. maybe. So it, it was a historic home that was built for that reason. That's and cool. we just used that room for the same reason. Oh, I see. Is it I coming see. together now? It is. It okay. is. Thank you. So now that we've moved past that. My bad. We're going into the roaring 20s. Okay. Around this time, the formalities of courting went out the door and couples started going on what we more traditionally think of as dates. From the beginning, men paid for dates, which was a power dynamic shift of sorts, since prior to that, women had kind of held the cards in the courting structure. Mm -hmm. So they brought the men to the house. Now men are paying for the dates and taking the women out. I read something in a New York Post article um, that shared that even the concept of men paying uh, on dates was a little layered. So as we all know, women aren't paid as much as men even today, but it was so, so much worse in the early 1900s. Employers paid women under the pretense that they were working to supplement their husband's income, so they used that as a rationale for paying them less, which meant then women could afford less. And that article I found quoted a woman who basically said, thank God for dates, otherwise I couldn't afford to eat if I had to pay for food every night. Well, that's kind of a modern concept too. Mm -hmm. So like I've definitely heard of people who like, and this is normally like in television shows or something, but they basically go on a bunch of Tinder dates just to be able to eat. Just have dinner. Yeah, so because sad. they don't have a lot of money because they're in school or something. Right. It, it feels like a lot of work. Yeah. I think I would just eat a lot of Chinese or something. Pizza. Just, so, yeah. A lot of pizza. Ramen noodles, man. So as we moved further into the 21st century, women found themselves interacting with a much wider pool of potential suitors either through college, work, whatever. It just widened the dating institution. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get my centuries wrong. I said 21st. Is that right? If it, it were like the, the 1900s? No, nope, 20th, 20th century. Yeah. Yep, I get my dates wrong. 20th century. All good. Um, so we're still talking about the 1900s. Um, at each level, the approach to dating became more and more about romance as a necessary precursor to marriage. So marriage remained the main goal. Uh, but people were more specifically looking to love their potential long-term partner, which had not been a concern in the time leading up to that. Sure. Uh, by the 1950s, couples were loudly and proudly sharing their commitment to one another in a dating environment by, quote, going steady. Uh, per custom, the man would give his female partner a sweater or a jacket or a ring, and that would symbolize them going steady. I just <laughs> like using the air quotes. As the 50s gave way to the 60s, sexuality entered the discussion more prominently than it ever had before. I was surprised to learn that the 50s is when things like necking and petting came into play. Mm. You thought it was late? Early? I thought it was early in the 50s. In the necking, not so much, but petting. Right. Uh, and it's what you think it is. I don't know. I don't know. Because, like, if you watch, again, I'm like, all of my knowledge comes from movies. <laughs> <laughs> but if you watch movies and they're set in the 50s, like, I'm even thinking about, like, Back to the Future and stuff. They all have, like, these little make-out yeah. points and stuff. Yeah. So. I don't know. Uh, those things became even more prominent. In fact, even being a sign of freedom and symbols of personal right with the 60s and notably the advent of birth control. Um, an article that I mentioned earlier pinned uh, the start of the, quote, hookup culture to this decade. Mm -hmm. um, Sexual revolution, baby. Woohoo! Uh, so technology sounds like it was the next big development for the dating world. And surprisingly, this blew my mind. Technology for dating may have even had a start in the U.S. even in the 60s mm -hmm. at Harvard when some enterprising students developed a dating questionnaire and ran it through an IBM mainframe computer to make matches, romantic matches. Oh. Um, that company ran for a couple of years and even expanded to company, uh, to campuses across the country. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Once that service died out, there's really not that much to say in the way of technology, unless we mention Charlene's screenshot phones from episode five. I don't know. That sounds like it could get interesting when it comes to dating. Yeah. You know what I mean? Little peekaboo shots. Uh-huh. Uh. <clears throat> Until the early and mid-90s when we saw Match.com, uh, it was founded in 1995. Uh, after that, the options proliferated. There were AOL chat rooms. Craigslist became a thing by the late 90s. Things like that. I think that's where I'm required to pull out my millennial card. One thing that's really fascinating about our generation is how we've lived straight through these technological innovations. Mm -hmm. That is to say, I'm simultaneously young enough to remember a friend's uncle online dating in the late 90s, early aughts, and thinking it was just the weirdest, creepiest thing in the world. And now I have friends that I'm not sure ever date outside of Tinder or Bumble or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I specifically remember like a line from Cruel Intentions where Ryan Philippe, Philip, what, Philippe, he's, Philippe. <laughs> I guess it, well, um, where he's talking and he's mentioning the internet and saying it's only for creeps and weirdos. Yeah. Or something similar to that. And then, yeah, absolutely. It's just like not the case, obviously. That was not very, um, forward thinking and it has not aged well yeah Ah. it's just weird to have two have your feet in two different sure generations so wrapping up this history of dating segment so i want to come back to charlene and bill's predicament as i was perusing source material for this segment one thing that stuck out to me is the ever-present question around is dating harder now or back then I think hard is always like relative and personal. Right. What's hard to me might be easy to you and vice versa. But I do feel like, dang, coordinating the logistics of dating, finding the right person, figuring out what to do and where to go, not wanting anyone to get the wrong idea about you. Um, that feels really hard, like in the 80s. So I'm thinking specifically about like Charlene's era. In the mm-hmm. 80s, like I was listening to her make phone calls with, or Suzanne make phone calls to set up the date and thinking about where they're going to go and... Charlene doesn't want too many people to see her doing this, that. It just feels like a lot. Yeah. Feels less relevant now. Um, Courting also sounds like it's ripe with potential for awkward, but at least it's pretty straightforward. I don't know. I feel like that one sounds the worst. Well, sure. I mean, from the perspective of like personal choice and freedom and whatever. But if you think about it practically, I think about things practically. Sure. If you're the woman, you just show up downstairs dressed with a smile on and the guy does all the work. He's got to impress your parents with his, like, personal resume. I don't, it sounds easy to me. Well, you know, got to make sure that you're worth two sheeps. Right. A quilt, some cups. And you just do your hair right, and you are. Um, <laughs> Perfection. And it seems to me, like, as we move away from courting through all of these decades of time, it just sounds like a lot of work. An app does seem like it makes things easier, at least logistically. But I don't know. Dating seems hard. Dating I'm glad to hard. be married. <laughs> yes. Anywho, at any rate, it's a tale as old as time. Person meets person, person falls in love, person swipes right. Is that right? Right? Left? Left? (laughs) Right? I don't know. Depends on... Oh, then you swipe right. Perfect. Uh, I don't know. I've never done it. But dating has changed a lot. I did. And I'm old. (laughs) Accidentally, but that's another story. (laughs) What I do know is, thanks for sticking around. This has been this week's edition of Extra Sugar.